After more than 900 hours of playing Grounded, I put together a list of the top things I wish I knew sooner. These things will make your experience much more enjoyable, and don't worry, there won't be any story spoilers, so you're safe to watch until the end. First up is going to be to peep every creature that you come across. So to peep a creature, what you're going to do is you're going to look at it through the peeper. On mouse and keyboard is the X key by default. On controller, it is the Y key. What this does is after you peep them, it will populate your data tab with creature cards. So every creature in the game that you can interact with will be able to be peeped. It'll give you different information on such as weaknesses and resistances, as well as which resources they drop. Some creatures will have more information down here, such as weak points as well. So just make sure you peep every creature. You will get a quest early on that will probably tell you to peep a creature. But after that, it's up to you to do it on your own. And I know a lot of people, especially newer players, We'll do it one time and then forget, so just make sure you're peeping every creature you come across. Second thing I wish I knew sooner is to analyze everything that could be analyzed. So when you pick up a resource and it goes into your inventory, you'll say you discovered it. When you go in your inventory, you'll see if it has a little exclamation point here, and that means it can be analyzed. In order to analyze it, what you're going to do is you're going to go to a field station. The field stations are scattered around the world, and anything that has a little exclamation point can be analyzed. There will be different colors. Some are red. I think some are blue, and there's other one other color. That's going to be the rarity. So you go up to the resource analyzer here. Select the resource you want to analyze and then just analyze it. What this is going to do is it's going to give you information about the resource, such as what it can be used to craft, as well as unlock the brain. It's going to give you raw science and also give you brain power. What the brain power does is it's going to unlock the different crafting levels here or different recipes here as you progress. So basically, this was put into place to prevent anybody from getting uh, basically stuck and not being able to progress. So just make sure you analyze everything. One other tip along the way, this is just a bonus part of this one, is you can analyze grass planks and weed stems, which you will collect as you're playing through the game. You just have to have them equipped in your hand. Those are the only two resources you have to have equipped. Everything else you can just analyze directly from your backpack. Third thing I wish I knew sooner is that you can perfect block in this game. So when you're in combat, the two ways that you can block are by just holding down the block key or by perfect blocking. What perfect blocking is, is timing the block perfectly, and it will thus reduce completely reduce damage taken as well as durability to your armor. So here we have a little lawn mite, and what we're going to do is we're going to get in, get him to come towards us. So if I just hold down the block key, you're going to notice I will take damage down in the uh, bottom left corner if he ever hits us. So we took a little bit of damage. However, if I perfect block, we're going to get the little spark. We're going to take no damage. Now, the great part about this is all the creatures in the game have specific attack patterns. Every creature has their own little attack patterns. You can basically learn them and then learn how to perfect block them. So theoretically, you could beat the entire game with no armor if you're good at perfect blocking, but you're probably not going to be able to do that at the beginning. So just learn how to perfect block. It's going to make your life a lot easier, especially early on when you don't have the best gear and when you're fighting really tough enemies because you're going to definitely come across those. Next up is going to be to make sure you equip mutations. So we should be unlocking a mutation really quickly here. We should be getting the Parry Master mutation from getting enough perfect blocks in a row. You're going to unlock mutations as you play through the game by just doing various things or by discovering various things. And there you can see we got Parry Master. So let's just get rid of this little lawn light. So when the mutation unlocks on the screen, what you're going to do is you're going to have to go into the status tab here and you're going to notice you have a list of mutations. Now, this is a brand new fresh start, so I only got this Parry Master unlocked right there. There are lots of mutations, as you can see. The one thing that I didn't know and I know a lot of people didn't know is you actually have to equip these. So when you unlock a mutation, just because it pops up on the screen does not mean it's going to be a passive mutation and give you bonuses. What you actually have to do is go into the status screen and make sure you equip it by clicking the equip button on mouse and keyboard at space. I believe it's probably, I'm not sure exactly what it is on controller, so you'll just see it down at the bottom here. So make sure you equip it. At the beginning of the game, you can have, I believe it's two mutations, and then later on you can unlock more slots to have more mutations. So just make sure you're using all your mutation slots and make sure you're picking the ones you want to have active and activating them. Next up is going to be to make sure you always have a glider equipped. To get a glider, what you're going to have to do is chop down a dandelion. Now, a dandelion is a weed, so this is actually going to give you a, a bonus tip here, which is that you can get weed stems before you get the tier 2 axe, because if you try to cut down the regular weeds, it's going to tell you you need a tier 2 axe. You can actually chop down the dandelions with the pebblet axe, and the, these will drop a couple of weed stems each. They're also going to drop these dandelion tufts. So here's the dandelion tuft. The dandelions drop these. What you do is you pick this up, and you're going to want to make sure you equip it, because it can be used as a glider. You have a glider slot over here, so you just push it over there and make sure you have it equipped. The reason you want to have this in place is because if you jump from a high spot, you can use the dandelion tuft to prevent you from taking fall damage. This is going to be super useful in certain parts of the game where you, if you fall, you might actually take critical fall damage. Next up is you can use your bow to reach things that you otherwise couldn't. So as you can see, here's a dew drop up here that I can't reach. Now, what I could do is punch the grass blade that it's on, or I could chop the grass blade down and it would fall. But instead, what I can do is I can just shoot the dew drop with my bow 
and then I can drink it as it falls down and then recollect my arrow. You can also use this for collecting berries, pupa, which we'll run into later on, as well as the purple flowers. These purple flowers that are over here will drop flower petals. Actually, the yellow ones will as well. They will drop flower petals underneath of them. If there's only a couple flower petals under there, what you can do is you can either climb up and punch them and get them down, or you can just shoot them with your bow and the flower petals will fall to the ground. Next up is going to be when your oxygen hits zero when you're underwater, you will drown. As you can see, I have an oxygen meter at the top of the screen right now, and it's slowly counting down. When that oxygen meter hits zero, I will, I will drown, and you'll have to respawn. In order to prevent this from happening, what you can do is you can either resurface, go to the top of wherever you are underwater. So we're going to resurface right here. It's going to slowly go back up. If you're in the koi pond, there are also air bubbles that come out of various places. And there's also some creatures that you kill. If you kill them underwater, it will replenish your oxygen. So just make sure your oxygen meter does not hit zero. I know in some other survival games, when it hits zero, you'll either have a couple of seconds to recover because it'll start like fading out or your HP will slowly start draining. That's not the case in grounded. When your oxygen meter hits zero, you will just you will instantly die. Next up is going to be that you can actually use your bow underwater. So as you can see, this water boatman's here and he's underwater. I can actually just shoot him with my bow by either being out of the water or if I'm in the water, what I can do is I can pop up, quickly shoot and harvest the resources from the creature. That's really useful if you don't have an underwater weapon and all you have is a bow on you. Next thing I wish I knew sooner is that you can actually put water containers underneath the juice boxes and collect juice from them. So if we place this right here underneath of it, what will end up happening is as this thing drips juice, which I think happens maybe once or twice a day or something like that, I'm not exactly sure the exact time on it, the juice will fill up in here and it'll just give you an easy source of liquids that you, so in case you come over to a place where you don't have like a normal base setup, you can just put these over there and it'll just be an easy source of hydration. Next up is going to be a way to make crude rope faster, and that's going to be to use the spinning wheel. Now, when you're starting the game out, you're probably going to find yourself running around and picking up plant fiber all over the ground. You're going to see it just sitting everywhere, and it takes forever to make yourself the crude rope because what you do is when you go into the crafting menu, you're going to notice to make crude rope, it costs three plant fiber for each one. Instead, if you get yourself a spinning wheel, what you can do is put the spinning wheel, put the plant fiber on the spinning wheel, and you can make one for one. So instead of making three plant fiber into one, you can make one plant fiber into one rope. It does take a little bit longer, but over the course of time, this is going to make your life much easier. Next up is going to be how to get the plant fiber even faster. And instead of picking the plant fiber up like I just did, what you can actually do is get yourself a grinder. And using the grinder, you can eat, input weed stems, grass planks, eelgrass strands, clover leaves, and sprigs. And as you can see, what this is going to do is it's going to convert them at different ratios into different amounts of plant fiber. Weed stems are the best, obviously. You put five weed stems in here, you're going to get 40 plant fiber. So if you're trying to make yourself a little crude rope automation system, make sure you get yourself the spinning wheel as well as the grinder. The next thing I wish I knew sooner was you can use the jerky racks to make leather. Along the same lines as the crude rope, what you can do is instead of crafting the berry chunks that you can get, and there's also another resource you can get later on to make leather, instead of taking three berry chunks and making one leather, what you can do is use them, use the jerky rack. So what I can do is I can place the three berry chunks on here, and instead of turning these into one leather, it'll turn into three leather. Next thing I wish I knew sooner is to set up sap catchers as soon as possible. What sap catchers do is allow you to collect sap passively. So instead of having to run around and collect it from different parts of the yard, you can set up sap catchers on different things such as the hedge over by the oak tree. Anywhere where you see sap being produced that's not like the really tiny little sticks, you can actually place sap catchers on them. The fallen log that's in, the fallen branches in the middle of the yard is also a great place. And what these do is they allow you to just collect up to five sap per day. And setting up a bunch of these is going to be very helpful later on. You'll thank me later because you're going to burn through tons of sap as you're playing through the game. Next thing I wish I knew sooner is you can break the web sacks for some tier two bug parts. The web sacks can be found usually where you're going to find orb weavers, and that's mainly going to be over by the hedge. They're also going to be in the oak tree. There's also some other places you can find them. These web sacks, when you burst them open, so we're going to pop it open, you're going to notice some spiderlings are going to come out of it, usually three of them. And we're just going to take care of these guys real fast. Now, you do need to be careful because actually there's four of them out of this one. So they will do quite a bit of damage to you if you're not careful. And they're also sometimes a pain in the butt to kill just because they're so small. And in this case, we did not, it didn't look like we get any, got any. But you can see there's a bunch of them over here. The resources you can get from it are bombardier parts, gnat fuzz, ladybug heads, stink bug gas axe, stink bug parts, and web fiber. You're going to, of course, need the web fiber to make the tier two rope. The stink, the other parts are going to be needed to make the jerky rack, which we already showed, as well as the tier two axe. So if you're having trouble defeating the tier two enemies, their tier two creatures that you're needing to make certain things in the game, Make sure you head over and find some web sacks. Just be careful that there's not some orb weavers or other spiders around. The spiderlings aren't terribly difficult to deal with, but some of the other ones can be. 
The next thing I wish I knew sooner is you can actually move the pallets that you can place both the grass planks and weed stems in. So I just cut down this weed and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up the weed stems here and rather than carrying them where I want to go, I'm going to place them in the pallet. You can actually relocate the pallet now and you can actually sprint with them. So you can actually sprint and take them wherever you want to go. This is super useful if you're building in a place that does not have a lot of resources near it and you need to transport them along with the ant, the red ant armor, which allows you to carry extra weed stems and grass planks. You can use the pallet and move it and just move things to wherever you need to go. Next up and along the same lines is you can use the zip lines for moving grass planks and weed stems. So all you do is look at the zip line and drop them and you'll notice what's going to happen is it's going to transport them down. So combining this with using the pallets, the red ant armor, you can make building much more efficient. And the last thing I wish I knew sooner before I started playing Grana was you can actually get three daily quests. So if you go over to the ASL terminals, which you can find at any of the field stations, as well as most of the labs around the yard, you can go to the center here where it says Burgle Quest, hit load, and you'll notice that, you'll, that you can have quests. I've already accepted my quest for the day, but you'll have three per day. Once you complete these quests, you'll get raw signs for them. When you come back the next day and to the ASL terminal, you can actually get three more. So make sure you do those every day because that's going to be your best way of getting raw science, which you're going to be needing to purchase things inside of the science shop. And if you found this video helpful, then you'll definitely want to watch this video where I share the best base locations in Grounded.